All right, I think we're ready now. We can turn to Matthew chapter 12. We'll be giving our attention to verses 22 to 37 in a, um, a message that I have entitled, Pick a Side. And that might give you a little bit of clue to, to the difficulty of today. I've got this introduction here of personal experience that I wanted to share. And, and I'll share that, but I, I, want, I want to say a couple other things just before we read. So, 25 years ago, I was a part of a men's group at a church. And for some reason, there was uh, just a, an inordinate amount of of Dallas Cowboy fans in this in this men's group. I don't know why, but it was just it was like it was out of balance. There's too many Cowboys fans. And the one of the main rivals, at least then, not as much, I guess a little bit now, but the Redskins, Washington Redskins, um, were the rival. But there was only like two Redskins fans. I mean we're talking about a group of like twenty people and most of them were fans of the Cowboys and only a couple Redskins fans. And I didn't really follow NFL football. I'm college football. I like college football. And I watch NFL just because it's football and I love football, but I didn't really follow a team. Okay? So I didn't have a, a dog in that hunt. You know, I was just like, Cowboys, Redskins, okay, whatever. But I, I needed to pick a side because when we got together, and especially when the Cowboys played the Redskins, I needed to be identified with one or the other. And so how was I going to choose which one I decided to support since I didn't really have a predisposed idea? Well, anybody, anybody want to guess who I picked? No, I didn't pick the Cowboys. Lewis, what's wrong with you? I picked the Redskins. And, and I, th- I think it was because they were in the minority and... The, all the Cowboys fans were like, they were real, they weren't all that successful necessarily, but they were really good at talking about being successful. Y'all know anybody like that? Uh, so anyway, I chose to side with my poor, lowly, red-skinned brothers over here. You know, there's only a couple of them. So anytime we, all the guys at the church get together, watch the Redskins and Cowboys, I went and got me a Redskins cap, and I show up, and I didn't have all the stuff, but I was... Solidly with the Redskins. And that, that's not a scientific way of choosing which side to be on. Because, you know, neither one was clearly better. In fact, the Redskins typically lost. But I still wanted to be with that group. I wanted to support, you know. Maybe it's just moral support. But at any rate, when we come to things like today, when we come to spiritual things, and... We start really diving into Scripture and seeing what Jesus says and the opposition that He receives today in this passage. You'll hear it straight from the mouth of Jesus. You need to pick a side. Who are you with? If you're not for Jesus, there's only one other option. You can't, you can't be indifferent. You can't be on the sidelines, uh, not nearly uh, like when I was trying to pick a football team to support. This is way more important. Because that didn't ultimately matter. This matters. This really matters. If, if, you, if you don't pick a side, you have picked a side. Does that make sense? And, and so here's, the, here's kind of what I was alluding to earlier in that I, I'm, I probably wasn't making a whole lot of sense that that happens sometimes. Today's scripture made me realize how easy it is to come into this room every week, maybe twice a week, maybe three times a week, to come into this room to sit in a place where we typically sit 
to sing a couple songs, to drop something in the offering plate, to listen to a sermon. It is so easy to do those things and never change. You can come to church, the gathering of the church. You can come to worship every single week for your entire adult life. And you can walk out and be no different on the inside. It's a terrible, terrible problem. It's a terrible um, possibility that you can be, it's possible to be so close to the things of Jesus Christ and they never make a difference in you. And and I, I, I I would hate for that to ever happen to anybody. I don't. I, I, I pastored a church in another city in this state, and in the same service, on the same day, at the same time, with the same words, the same Bible, I would preach. And after the service, there was there was a lady. She just passed away not too long ago. She sat on the second row on this side. Her name was Freda Suttles. And every single week, she would come up to me after the service practically in tears and and she here's what she say thank you so much for teaching me the bible and i was just like going back what what all did i say but she was man she was in tune she was listening she was engaged she wanted to hear the word of god and she wanted to learn and she did and on the same service at the same time on the same day in the same room the same text of Scripture, the same sermon preached. Others walk out completely unaffected. I didn't, I didn't preach two sermons. I said the exact same thing. One time, one person is overcome with the, with the influence. Another person heard the same thing, just like indifferent. I don't know how that happens. Well, yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Because you can be here, and if you're not tuned in, if you're not uh, desiring the things of God, then you, you won't get them. I heard it put this way one time. It's, it's never left me. Everybody gets what they want. If you want more of Jesus, man, He'll give you more than you can handle. If you, if, you want, if you don't care about more of Jesus, you won't get it. It's not because it's not available. It's because do we really want it? Do, do we really come to this room on this day every week because we really want more of Jesus? Or is it just something we do? Because that's what we do. We need to pick a side. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. Here's what the Holy Spirit has said through Matthew. Then a demon-possessed man, who was blind and mute, was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. All the crowds were amazed, and were saying, This man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And and knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons... By whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me. 
and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will speak to our hearts clearly. Help us to hear you. For your glory and our good. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. This scripture is so important. It, it's so vital to our lives as Christians as followers of Jesus it's it's important to everybody regardless of where you stand with Jesus if you're here today and you're not sure of what you think about Jesus and the Bible and the church and all those things that's cool hey I'm glad you're here first of all but it, this is important for you if you're here today and you are absolutely 100% positive that you're following Jesus you belong to him you've been forgiven of your sins and you're going to heaven this is really important for you it doesn't matter where you fall on that spectrum. This text is so very vital to all of us. And so I don't want to delay. I want to kind of get through this. And, and there's a lot to say. There's a lot of things that other people have written that are so much better than what I could come up with. And so I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I will read some quotes to you today that I think are profound. But let me just get to the text. The first thing we see in this scripture is that spiritual battle require spiritual weapons. Spiritual battles need spiritual weapons. From verse 22 all the way down to verse 30, this scenario, once again, that involves Jesus and the Pharisees, there's a man who is demon-possessed, and because of that, he can't speak, and he can't see. This demon possession has caused these other problems, and the man was therefore brought to Jesus. He couldn't find his way. So, you know what that means? This is a little side note. If you're taking notes, this is a good one. You, you need to be careful about who you surround yourself with. Who your friends are. Are they so faithful that they will take you to Jesus? Because he, he couldn't get there. He couldn't see. He couldn't talk. But he had some friends, obviously. They took him to Jesus. Because it says a man was brought to Jesus. So somebody had some faith and belief. So the man was possessed by the demon. He was blind. He was mute. And, and just matter of fact, Jesus healed him. There's, there's not a lot of detail there. See verse 22. And he healed him so that the mute man spoke and saw. End of story. That's a, that's a miracle. Right? But that's not the real focus because that sets up the scenario with the Pharisees. Right? Because what happens? The crowds are amazed and they're questioning is this him? Could this be him? Is this the Messiah? Because that, you know, that's what the prophet said, that he was going to be doing this stuff, and, he, and look what just happened. So the, the crowds are amazed. But you know who's not amazed? The Pharisees. Remember what we talked about last week? About how the Pharisees opposed everything that Jesus did, not because uh, they were disagreeing with what he was doing, but because it threatened their position and their power and authority. And that's what they were really worried about. And remember this piece? They didn't care about the people at all. And once again, what should you do when a man who is demon-possessed and blind and can't talk, what should you do when that man gets healed and delivered? You should throw a party, right? Because everybody should be celebrating at that point. But the Pharisees weren't. The Pharisees were not celebrating. They tried 
to discredit the idea of Jesus being the Messiah. Because when you're in a crowd and Jesus does something like that, and the crowd starts saying, is this, is this the one? Then you see your power start to slip away. Right? If you're a Pharisee, you're like, oh no. They're, they're believing. They're about to believe in Him. We've got to say something. We've got to do something. Because we can't have that. So they try to discredit this idea. And here's what they say. The most ignorant statement perhaps ever, ever uttered. They say, in verse 24, This man casts out demons by the ruler of demons. Now, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian, not, whatever. That just does not make any sense. Why would somebody who is in charge of demons want to get rid of demons? Right? Does that make sense to anybody? It doesn't make sense. It's very ignorant, but it just shows you the desperation of the Pharisees. They don't know what to say, so they just start talking nonsense. Whatever the first thing comes out of their mouth, and it doesn't make any sense. So Jesus picks up on that, and not to mention, the, the Scripture says, verse 25, He knew their thoughts. That's helpful. He responds, what, this is what I would call a truth bomb. You ever seen those? Just, just like It just goes everywhere. You can't get away from it. Jesus says, every kingdom, every city divided against itself will not stand. Verse 25. Every kingdom, every city. If it's divided against itself, it won't stand. If Satan casts out Satan, then that means he's divided, so his kingdom is going to be kaput. So that, it doesn't make any sense to say that Jesus is using the power of demons to get rid of demons. And so he asks this rhetorical question to reveal the Pharisees' ignorance. So if I'm casting out demons by the devil, then how are y'all doing it? Because, you know, if it's not God's power, what power is it? Does that mean you also are casting out demons by the power of demons? So he puts it on them. Their own people claim to exercise demons as well. That means their own people's behavior is going to prove their argument to be false. And so that's why Jesus says, uh, verse 27... By whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. In other words, your own people are going to just show how ignorant that was. It's not logical. It's not possible. It's not true. So the Pharisees' view of Jesus is untenable. David Turner writes, It's illogical. It's contrary to experience. And it is inconsistent. They slander Jesus for doing the same thing they do. It makes no sense. But, of course, you know... What's the Pharisee good at? Judging people and using a double standard. That's what they do. Right? They're not, not worried about the people, and they're certainly not wanting anyone to look at their own lives. They just want to tell you what to do. So the only option for Jesus not working by the power of the devil is that he's working with the Spirit of God, and that's not a truth that they want to deal with. But that is the truth nonetheless. So Jesus is empowered by the Spirit of God. So what does that tell all the crowds and all the Pharisees? Jesus says it himself in verse 28. He says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. That's scary to a Pharisee especially. Once they realize the kingdom of God is at hand. And isn't that what Jesus said from the very beginning? The kingdom of God is at hand. He's here. The, the king of the kingdom is standing there. And he is fulfilling all the prophecies concerning himself. So at this point, Jesus uses this illustration about a strong man being bound. And I want you to see very clearly what Jesus has done. He says in verse 29... How can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, then he will plunder his house? You know what Jesus has just done to the devil? He's bound him up and he's delivered someone. That's what it talks about plundering his house. This man was demon possessed. So Jesus is in a battle with a strong enemy but, but not stronger than him. And so he binds him up, delivers that possession out of his house. So the demon is gone, 
And so Jesus is illustrating. You see what I just did? This, this demon-possessed man, I had, to, I had to go put my hands on my enemy and bind him up. And now he's powerless. And now the man is delivered. And he's not just delivered, he's healed because now he speaks and sees. And so Jesus at this point says something that is very profound and very crucial for our understanding. Verse 30, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. You see, when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to our standing with Jesus, understand this. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. You cannot, there is no such thing as an, as an undecided. You, you, know, you know what I mean? You understand why that, that's the case? If you say you're undecided, you're really decided. You just don't want to admit it. Because to, to put off following Jesus is to say no to Jesus. Right? See, see, when Jesus makes His offer to us, and it requires a response... So here's what's happening. The entire time we're saying to ourselves, well, let me think about it. That means you, at least for the time being, you've said no. Because you hadn't said yes. And there's only two answers. Either you follow Jesus or you don't. Either you're with Jesus or you're not. Either you're gathered with Him or you're scattered. There's no middle ground. You can't ride the fence when it comes to spiritual matters. Leon Morris wrote that in any moral issue, we are forced to take sides. I may have little power to influence the outcome, but if I do nothing, then I am saying in effect, as far as I'm concerned, that tyrant can do as he wishes. So Jesus says of anyone who does not side with him in his conflict with evil, this person is against me. I heard a quote months ago said the only thing necessary for evil to succeed is that good men do nothing. If you stand, you know, and this seems to be a growing problem in our culture. You know what happens when someone is walking down a sidewalk and gets mugged or beat up and people are standing there and, and here's somebody beating on somebody. They're innocent, they're helpless. And you know what's happening? Instead of somebody having a backbone and being a man and jumping in there and pulling that person away and stopping it, you know what they're doing? I wish I had my phone with me. Let me video it. How about jump in there and help somebody? Did that ever occur to anyone? But for some reason, there are less and less men willing to step in and actually be men and do what's required of them. Human beings in general. What, what is happening to a society when you'd rather take a video of someone getting beat up than actually stop them from getting beat up? Does that make any sense to anybody? It doesn't to me. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm by myself. I don't know if anybody else shares my opinion, but that's the way I see things. And I don't understand why it's so difficult. I had a professor in seminary tell me 15 years ago that common sense is now a superpower. Because apparently very few people have it. And, and I would say now instead of a blessing, common sense has become a curse. Because if you do have it, now you have to put up with all the people who don't have it. And that makes it even more difficult. Right? What happened to... These things are common. Everyone knows these things. When you see someone in trouble, what do you do? You help. You don't take a video. I'm sorry, I'm getting off track. I apologize. If you don't stay close to Jesus, then you will scatter. Picture a, a flock of sheep. They have to be herded. They have to be kept together so they'll be safe. So they'll be cared for properly, right? If you don't gather, you scatter. If you're scattered, you're helpless. Because you're not under the protection of the shepherd. If you're not with Jesus, you're against Jesus. And by the way, if the kingdom of God has truly arrived through the ministry of Jesus, then opposition to Him is unthinkable, and to be neutral is impossible. 
the one who does not actively support Jesus and the kingdom is in opposition to Jesus and the kingdom. Does that make sense? If you're not for Jesus, if you're not actively for Jesus, then you are against Him. Regardless of how you may choose to try to process that information. Spiritual battles need spiritual weapons. And the only spiritual weapons, according to Ephesians 6, is the full armor of God. That's where we find our weapons for this battle. Number two, don't be unforgivable. And this sounds terrible. But in the next two verses, Jesus points out that there is a sin, there is an infraction against God that is unforgivable. And what is that exactly? What Jesus is trying to say is there are consequences. He just talked about if you're not for me, you're against me. If you don't gather with me, you scatter. Well, there are consequences for that. For, for not gathering with Jesus. There are consequences. Which side are we on? The Bible says, Jesus says, as a matter of fact, any sin or blasphemy is forgivable except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God. Unbelief in Jesus can ultimately be forgiven through repentance and faith. If you don't believe in Jesus, but then you get saved and you start believing in Jesus, then that sin is forgivable, right? Because you got saved. But speaking against the Holy Spirit of God is a very unique rebellion. It involves more than just simply rejecting Jesus and the Gospel for a time. It includes attributing the Spirit's work to the devil. And it is intentional and not ignorant. See, if you, if you look at what the Pharisees are doing, man, I've got so much here I want to tell you, and I'm going to have to cut this a little bit short, just uh, so we won't be here for another half an hour. So, the text tells us that the Pharisees are speaking ignorantly, but they are not ignorant. You understand the difference? The statement they made makes them look ignorant. But they're not ignorant because they, they know exactly what they're doing. They understand exactly who Jesus is. This is not random. They understand that their opposition to Jesus is on purpose, knowing full well who He is and what He's come to do. And they understand that because of who He is and what He's there to do, is he's their enemy because he's going to displace them and they're not going to have any authority or position anymore because they are not of God and he is the king of the kingdom right so when Jesus shows up he's showing them and the people around that you you have to be with me or you're against me and so these Pharisees are committing a sin that is unforgivable in this age or in the age to come he says in verse 32 and, and here's what it is this unforgivable sin. I'm going to quote a couple of people here. because They say it so perfectly. David Turner writes, The Pharisees' response to Jesus and His Spirit-empowered miracles, their response to this goes well beyond mere unbelief. They slander the Spirit's ministry to, to Jesus by accusing Him of collaborating with, with the very forces that He is overpowering. That is the unforgivable sin. They are attributing the work of God to Satan. And it's not, uh, this is Leon Morris that writes this, it's not that God refuses to forgive, it is that the person who sees good as evil, and evil as good, is unable to repent. As long as they're in that that position, they're unable to repent, so they won't come humbly before God for forgiveness. And there, listen, there is no other way to forgiveness but repentance and faith in Christ. That is the only way. And as long as you're thinking that good is evil and evil is good, you're, you're not going to repent. And so as long as that's the case, you're unforgivable. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's scriptures you can go look at. 1 John uh, chapter 2 talks about people who, who went out from us because they were never really of us. They were in our number, but they weren't really part of the church, spiritually speaking. So they left because they weren't. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, talks about falling away, apostasy. 
And, and, and this is what I was alluding to earlier that is so dangerous. How much of the truth can we be exposed to? How much of this eternal life can we sample without ever actually surrendering to Jesus? We can be in the building, we can hear the Scriptures, we can sing the songs, we can bow our head during the prayers, we can even put our finances in the offering plate. But if you have not surrendered to Christ and repented of your sins, all those things amount to nothing. They're just powerless, empty gestures. A break with what you have formerly adhered to. Apostasy, falling away. In fact, D.A. Carson said that our past participation in the blessings of the gospel are only valid if we keep on in it. If we continue. Because how long, how long do people... Have you ever seen somebody... you ever seen this happen? I've only seen it a couple of times. Where somebody comes to church and they're part of the church and they're, like, they're faithful, they're all, there all the time. And then and maybe 5, 10, maybe 20 years, and then all of a sudden, something happens. Sometimes you don't even know what. Something happens, and they just, they're just gone. And they're not coming back. What do we do with that? Well, the Bible says, Did, were, you, were you ever really apart? Were you ever really fully surrendered? Or was it just you were... You, did you know it's possible for it's possible to be saved to the church culture and not be a Christian? It, there's a lot of benefits to be part of a church. There's good things. There's fellowship. There's I mean, if you're in a Baptist church, you're always going to get a good meal, right? And that's, that's a benefit. H- have you had some of the desserts that happened down here? My word, there's benefits. Some people. Are, are drawn with the culture. They they never get in touch with Jesus, and so they can be in the church but not in Christ, and that makes a big difference. Man, there's so much I want to say. I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to move on. Number three, last one. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs four twenty three says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Your heart, the central part of your emotions and your being, that's who we are. Really, that's who we are. And this is a reference to the Sermon on the Mount, specifically Luke's Gospel account, chapter 6, around verse 43. A good tree yields good fruit, a bad tree yields bad fruit, Every tree is judged by the quality of the fruit it produces. And Jesus sees the Pharisees for who they really are. And He calls them by that name. A brood of vipers. A pit full of snakes. Venomous, poisonous snakes. Harmful. They're wicked. Because He says and points out to us, whatever is in your heart is going to eventually and then consistently... Come out of your mouth. You know, there's all kind of different sayings that um, difficult situations build character uh, and, and things. I, I disagree. Difficult situations may early on build character. They don't build it, they reveal it. You get in a stressful situation, whatever's inside is coming out. Do I have to? I don't really. I don't, Time's just, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to apologize. Uh, I'm driving to church this morning. What, what do I tell you all the time? What happens on Sunday morning? Everything that can go wrong. I'm driving to church this morning. Did you know that these are not the clothes I had on when I left the house? I had a, somebody left a, a styrofoam cup from Sonic they had washed out and put on, and I used it for my coffee this morning. I had a full 20-ounce cup. 
And I got about halfway here, and I was more than halfway done with my coffee. And I had the steering wheel in this hand and the coffee in this hand. And something happened. I don't even know what happened. And it went to slip, and I went to grab it like that, and the whole thing just dumped all over me and my driver's seat in the truck. And at that moment, I had a decision to make. What am I going to think, and what am I going to say, and who's going to see me or hear me? And oddly enough, I have no explanation except for Jesus. I didn't say a word. I think I was in shock. So I was just, and I wanted to not wreck. And so I'm just driving, soaking wet with warm coffee. And then I'm thinking, it's, it's a typical Sunday morning. What, what am I supposed to do in that situation? Did God not know that was going to happen? What's in my heart? There was a time when if that would have happened, I'd be worried about who was with me and what they might, what they might hear me say. And thankfully, this morning, nothing happened. I got here. Thankfully, I had a change of clothes in the closet. And here I am. It's nothing that's worth harming my witness over. Because the Bible says in verse 36, every person is going to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word comes out of our mouths. And you know why? Because that sounds a little fishy if you if you just read it. Wait, well, does that mean we're not judged on what Jesus did? We're judged on what we say and do? No, not exactly. But what we say is an indication of what's in our hearts. And Jesus cares a whole lot about what's in our hearts. So if it's an indication of who we are really. Because your words reflect your heart condition. So what are we supposed to, to do with that? By your words you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned. Jesus says we need to guard our hearts because there is so much that could influence us that would cause us to respond to things in a way that does not reflect a relationship with Jesus. That's, that's all I really know to say about that. And there, there's a lot of things that I'd like to say and... And we're not going to get to them today. But let me just conclude with some, um, maybe some personal application, some personal inventory. There's three questions that I put up on the screen that I'm going to ask of myself. Because this scripture today is really important. And these, these are like the top three things that, that I thought of myself. How, how do I process this? How, how do I think about these things? What does it truly mean to side with Jesus? If you have to pick a side, what does that really look like? It, it, means, may, uh, it means maybe we uh, don't fully understand the commitment or the devotion that's required. Maybe we don't truly understand that, that siding with Jesus means way more than, than we might uh, anticipate it means. The second question is, what really is at stake in believing in Jesus or rejecting Jesus? What, what's really, you know, what, what are we talking about here? What are the consequences? And the, the third question is, what's the connection between our hearts and who we truly are? Because when I ask myself those questions and I consider this text and I see where Jesus says, you've got to pick a side. Because there is... A sin that is unforgivable. There are consequences to 
gathering to Jesus or scattering away from Jesus. There are indications in our lives that can tell us, all right, how really, how, how close am I really to Jesus? Because what's coming out of my heart when things get um, unfortunate or un- unforeseen, or when things happen that are are not good, how do we respond? What comes out of our hearts at those moments? Because that tells us way more about our our own hearts than maybe we want to deal with. Here's the conclusion. After you ask those three questions of yourself and you try to come to to terms with those things, I, I, I don't know really how else to put it. Life is short. Eternity is long. And following Jesus is no joke. And following Jesus is not showing up to a a church service on Sunday. It is that. It's not just that. It's way more than that. So I think we would all do well to kind of take a serious look at where we stand with the Lord, pray for the Spirit's wisdom in our lives going forward, and, and honestly... We will have to get to a point where we start to understand that I don't I don't want to just be close to the things of God. I don't want to just be in the vicinity of the things of God. I, I want I want to be with Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I I, I can't just check the boxes, and expect everything to be okay. We can't just assume, well, I've I've been going to church my whole life. I'm not a bad person. And I hate to be the one to break this to you. You're a bad person. So am I. We're all, we're all bad. Because not one of us in this room, not one of us on this planet is getting into heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ. It's just, it's just that simple. We, we can't afford to play around with eternity. It's not, it's not about a perfect attendance at church. It's not about checking those Christian boxes. Those things help. But that's not what the, the root of the matter is. What have you done with Jesus? Are you, are you united with Christ because of His death and resurrection? Are you following Christ daily? Doesn't mean you're perfect. Doesn't mean you don't stumble. Are you following Jesus? Do you long for the things of Jesus? Is that your desire? Is that what you want? That's what's important. It's so important. Let me pray.